Hello, everybody. We're going to hit you up with another presidential election. This one, the election of 1832. Andrew Jackson going to go for the second term, but he is facing opposition from three sides. Can you get it done? Let's find out right now. Now, we're going to start, as always, with the incoming party, and that is the Democratic Party. Andrew Jackson, elected in 1828, kind of getting a sense of revenge over John Quincy Adams. And he is going to go for the second term as president in this situation. Andrew Jackson is from Tennessee, the first president up to this point who is not from either Massachusetts or Virginia. Remember, both the Adamses were from Massachusetts and four of the first five presidents were from Virginia. So kind of a fresh face, so to speak, in the White House. And also a new process um, um, begins in this election year to nominate candidates for president and vice president, and that is national conventions. Um, national conventions, they meet, they nominate the president and the vice president, they write the party platform, and they do a variety of other things. And it all starts in this election. Uh, the Democrats are going to hold their national convention and they are going to renominate Andrew Jackson for a second term as president. Jackson is really not facing any opposition to his candidacy. But now the next question is, who is the vice presidential nominee going to be? Um, John C. Calhoun was re-elected alongside Jackson in 1828 and their relationship became strained for a number of reasons. Uh, most notably, a difference in opinions regarding the nullification crisis um, that took place in South Carolina as a result of the tariff of abominations that was passed in 1828 and the involvement of Calhoun's wife, Fluoride, which would be the second lady of the United States, in the Eaton Affair. Now, the Peggy Eaton Affair was a scandal that involved the Secretary of War, John Eaton, and his wife Peggy. Much like Andrew Jackson and Rachel Jackson, um, Secretary Eaton and Peggy married while Peggy was still married to another man. Um, when this scandal caught some wind, um, the other wives of the cabinet members refused to socialize with the Eatons. And Jackson hated this because he knew um, how this how scandals like these um, caused the death of his wife Rachel so he had great sympathy for Peggy um, this went on until April of 1831 when Jackson requested the resignation of all of his cabinet members but one and I believe that was the postmaster general he was the only cabinet member to stay on Jackson's cabinet after this Peggy Eaton affair. Now, the secretary of his secretary of state, Martin Van Buren, um, had a pivotal role to play in this because he was the one who ended the affair. Um, Van Buren was a widower, losing his lot, losing his wife in the late 18 teens, so he didn't um, have a wife to get involved in this scandal with. So, and Van Buren instigated this procedure as a means of removing Calhoun's supporters from the cabinet. Now, Calhoun further aggravated his relationship with Jackson in the summer of 1831 when he issued his Fort Hill letter in which he outlined the constitutional basis for a state's ability to nullify an act of Congress. Of the nullification crisis, as I said earlier, came out of the tariff of 1828 or the tariff of abomination. South Carolina was not too happy about this, and they believed they had to write the right to nullify the tariff within their borders. Remember, this question of nullification came up in the late 1790s, the first time around with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now we're seeing it here in the 1830s, a potential civil war coming early, and the topic of nullification is hot on the bench, so to speak. Um, eventually, South Carolina relents. Um, they 
tone down the nullification rhetoric and they agree to a modified tariff. The tariff gets modified. Um, a force bill is passed, which gave the president the right to use force in order for South Car in order to make South Carolina pay the duties that came from the tariff, and the crisis was put it put to an end as a result. Now, the final blow to the relationship. Um, between President Jackson and Vice President Calhoun, which is already rocky enough as it is, um, came when the president nominated Van Buren to serve as minister to Britain. Now, this was a recess appointment, and if you know your U.S. government, recess appointments have to be filled. Um, recess appointments have to be confirmed by the Senate once they come back from whatever recess they're on. So the vote in the Senate ended in a tie and on January 25th, 1832, um, using his power as vice, as vice president slash president of the Senate, um, he um, broke the tie and the Senate rejected Van Buren's confirmation. And Van Buren um, was, and Calhoun who thought this would be an end to Van Buren's political career. Um, and this is not. Um, Van Buren is going to be nominated by the Democratic Party as Jackson's running mate. And eventually, Vice President Calhoun would become the first president in American history to resign. From the presidency. Now, the next party we're going to talk about is the National Republicans. National Republicans hold their um, national convention, and they nominate Kentucky Senator Henry Clay um, for the presidency. This is the second time Henry Clay has ran for the presidency. He would run one more time in 1844. And he is going to bring along for the ride John Sargent of Pennsylvania. Now, there is a share of third parties in this situation. One of them is the Anti-Masonic Party. Um, the Anti-Masonic Party was a single-issue party that was opposed to Freemasonry. Um, they actually hold the very first national convention in American history. And they put up as presidential candidates William Wirtz, who is a former attorney general from Maryland, and Richard Rush, who is the secretary, who is a former secretary of the Treasury of Pennsylvania. Richard Rush, if you remember, um, was the vice presidential nominee <coughs> for the National Republicans in the last election, 1832. So at the end of the day, that convention is going to nominate Mr. Wirtz as their candidate for president. And ironically enough, um, the anti-Masonic party was opposed to Freemasonry, but the guy they nominated for president, William Wirtz, was a Freemason. So a bit of irony there. Um, Mr. Wirt is going to bring along for the ride Amos L. Maker of Pennsylvania as his running mate. Now we have another third party, and that is the Nullifier Party. The Nullifier Party was created in South Carolina. It was a single-issue party. Um, they were for the nullification of the tariff of 1828, and they are going to nominate the governor of Virginia, John Floyd, as their presidential candidate, Floyd does not actively campaign for the presidency, but it looks like that he pretty much goes with it. Um, he's going to bring along for the ride Henry Lee of Massachusetts as his running mate. Now, the campaign for the election of 1832 revolved around the Second Bank of the United States. President Jackson was opposed to the National Bank. Um, he disliked really um, paper money in general. And he vetoed the renewal of the bank's charter. Uh, the bank's charter was set to expire in 1836. Henry Clay wanted to go on ahead and renew it early. 
and Jackson vetoed um, the renewal. Um, Henry Clay hoped that by he was go he would make pressure Jackson into signing um, the bill for rechartering and hopefully crush his bid for re-election. Obviously, the old general, the old hero of New Orleans, outflanked Clay and vetoed the charter. And he actually ordered um, the federal deposits excuse me, that were in the National Bank to be transferred over to state or pet banks. Um, he had to go through multiple secretaries of the treasury um, before he can get this done, but it happened nonetheless. And this really shows to this trust that Jackson had in his cabinet. He was actually more um, inclined to receive the advice of an informal set of men, which he calls his kitchen cabinet. These are friends. These were members of the party. You know, newspaper editors, politicians, the whole nine yards. And they got the name Kitchen Cabinet because it was said that these guys enter the White House through the kitchen door. Um, by, by pressuring, by... Um, hoping to win the election, Clay hoped to divide Jackson's supporters and curry favor in Pennsylvania, which is the headquarters of the National Bank, by attacking Jackson. Um, Clay's supporters criticized Jackson's use of the presidential veto power. He used it a lot, um, portraying him as King Andrew. Now, these attacks in general failed. Um, Jackson was convinced, um, convinced the ordinary population, remember he was um, for the common man, that he was defending them against a pledged elite. And his campaign events, although Jackson himself never campaigned, remember it was tradition in these days to have surrogates do the campaigning for you, but these events nonetheless were marked by enormous turnouts. Now, with that in mind, let's get to the results right now. Andrew Jackson easily going to win re-election. He is easily going to win re-election um, despite the fact that Clay and his supporters are heavily funded by the National Bank. Jackson's going to win 219 electoral votes. He's going to carry 16 states. Senator Clay is going to finish in second place. He's going to win 49 electoral votes in six states. Um, Governor Floyd is going to get the electoral votes of South Carolina. And Mr. Wirt is going to get the electoral votes of Vermont for the anti-Masons. In terms of the popular vote, 54.2% for Andrew Jackson, 37.4% for Henry Clay, and 7.8% for William Wirtz. Um, South Carolina did not count the popular vote in 1832, so Governor Floyd did not get a popular vote. He was only on the ballot in South Carolina, by the way. Now, a couple of big things coming out from this election. Um, no president was again able to secure a majority of the popular vote in two consecutive elections until Grant, until Ulysses Grant did this in 1872. Um, to date, only two other presidents from the Democratic Party were ever able to replicate this fleet, this feat. FDR did it in 1936 the first time and Barack Obama did it in 2012. Um, and also no president would succeed again in securing re-election until Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Um, the Bank of the United States would uh, 
eventually be dead, and this would cause problems for Jackson's successors, and an economic panic is about to come out from all this. Um, Jackson is going to step away after two terms, so the election of 1836 will determine who is going to replace him. And with that, I hope you all are having an excellent day. If you haven't seen any of my previous videos, go ahead and watch those if you want to. I hope you enjoyed this one as well. And we will see you next time for the election of 1836.